The U.S. Army is preparing a significant refresh of its tracked rocket artillery, signaling a methodical shift toward common software, extended range, and tighter integration with Allied fleets. Rather than pursuing an all-new launcher, the service has opened a market research effort aimed at rebuilding older M270 launchers to the M270A2 configuration. The inquiry, issued by Army Contracting Command at Redstone Arsenal, seeks to map out industry capacity for a six-year program spanning fiscal 2027 through 2032 and covering production, training, and sustainment. It's an early but consequential step that frames how the Army intends to keep its heaviest rocket system relevant for the decade ahead. The approach centers on recapitalization, taking existing M270A0 and M270A1 vehicles and bringing them up to a common A2 standard. That standard is anchored by the Common Fire Control System, or CFCS, which the Army is positioning as the digital backbone for both M270 and its wheeled cousin, HIMARS. Unifying fire control software and interfaces promises fewer unique parts, streamlined training, and faster updates across the rocket artillery enterprise. The result the Army wants is a launcher family that behaves consistently in garrison and at the firing point, regardless of whether it rides tracks or wheels. Into that digital architecture plug the newest precision munitions. The recapitalized launchers are being designed to handle the Extended Range Guided Multiple Launch Rocket System, or GMLRSR, which pushes effective reach to roughly 150 km while preserving the familiar six-rocket pod configuration. That expanded envelope opens more targets and firing positions, allowing batteries to operate from safer standoff ranges or cover larger sectors without relocation. The path also aligns M270A2 with the Precision Strike Missile, the successor to Atticms. PRSM is built for ranges out to about 500 km, trading some warhead mass, around 91 kg, for higher accuracy and magazine depth, and thereby multiplying the number of aim points a battalion can service during a fight. The modernization extends beyond software and munitions compatibility. The M993A2 carrier vehicle receives upgrades alongside the integration of the improved armored cab, which enhances crew protection and reduces fatigue during long alert cycles. While the silhouette of the launcher is largely unchanged, crews can expect a quieter, better protected workspace with improved ergonomics and maintainability. Those human factors matter in sustained operations, where the difference between an easy-to-service component and a cramped access panel can translate to more launchers ready for the next mission. For the industrial base, the Army's notice reads like a stress test of capacity and discipline. Interested companies are being asked to describe not just their throughput for multi-year recap efforts, but also their financial footing, technical depth, program management rigor, and ability to retain skilled workers over time. The government highlights schedule control, performance tracking, and risk management as essential competencies, underscoring that this is a production and sustainment challenge rather than a science project. Firms will need to meet security requirements as well, including secret-level facility clearances, to handle sensitive technical data and government-furnished information. International operators are an explicit part of the calculus. Many U.S. partners feel M270 variants and are steering toward similar A2-like configurations. By pushing CFCS and related upgrades as a shared standard, the Army is nudging Allied fleets toward interoperability in software, procedures, and spare parts. In practical terms, that means more opportunities for cross-servicing, more consistent training pipelines, and fewer technical seams during combined operations. A launcher from one country that speaks the same digital language as its counterpart next to it shortens the route from target queue to coordinated salvo. The notice is careful to emphasize what it is not. This is a sources sought announcement, not a solicitation, and it carries no funding for response preparation. Companies that decline to participate are not barred from future competitions. The tone signals early shaping the government is taking stock of who can deliver sustained recapitalization at scale and at a predictable pace, before it drafts the documents that would turn this concept into contracted work. 
That restraint is typical for complex, multi-year programs where aligning expectations in advance can avert costly detours later. The operational rationale for recapitalization is straightforward. Upgrading existing equipment shortens timelines and stretches budgets in ways that new start programs rarely can. The M270 hull has decades of combat credibility, marrying it with modern fire control and a pipeline of longer-reaching munitions preserves sunk investment while avoiding the integration risk of a brand new chassis. At the same time, CFCS promises a cleaner sustainment picture. Software baselines can be standardized across launchers, training syllabi can converge, and depots can rationalize parts inventories. On the battlefield, soldiers moving between HIMARS and M270 will navigate fewer idiosyncrasies and more common workflows, speeding certification and reducing retraining when units shift equipment. There is also a deterrence logic to the move. Long-range precision fires are a central feature of contemporary land combat, used to suppress enemy air defenses, strike logistics hubs, and shape the fight well beyond the forward line of troops. A launcher that can throw rockets to 150 km and missiles to 500 km, from a protected cab and with a common digital brain, complicates an adversary's planning. It forces opponents to disperse assets, harden critical nodes, and commit more resources to counter-reconnaissance and air defense. In peacetime, the promise of a larger coalition operating common launchers with compatible munitions raises the cost of aggression without firing a shot. Execution will determine whether the promise materializes. The recapitalization line will have to intake aging vehicles, deal with the variability inevitable in legacy fleets, and turn them around on predictable schedules. Software integration will have to keep pace with munitions development so that CFCS-equipped launchers can accept new increments of GMLRS or PRSM without long certification gaps. Training teams will need to deliver coherent instruction to U.S. units and foreign partners alike, while logisticians translate common into real reductions in backorders and maintenance timelines. If those pieces align, the Army will get more ready launchers, more of the time, with fewer unique parts and a wider range of target options. For industry, the opportunity is compelling but demanding. Success is less about dazzling prototypes and more about mature processes, stable supply chains, and disciplined program control. Respondents that can demonstrate credible throughput, secure facilities, and a track record of managing multi-year defense production will be the ones best positioned if and when the Army proceeds to a formal competition. Meanwhile, allies watching the process will be gauging how quickly and affordably the A2 standard can be fielded, since their own timelines and budgets often ride on U.S. program momentum. In that sense, the Army's market research is a bellwether. It signals where the service wants to go with rocket artillery, common software across platforms, greater reach through new munitions, better crew protection, and broader coalition alignment. It also signals how it intends to get there, not by discarding proven hardware, but by rebuilding it with modern brains and better protection, then training soldiers and partners to fight as a unified system. If the eventual program turns those intentions into repeatable outcomes, the M270's next chapter will look less like a sequel and more like a quiet reinvention, one built in depots and classrooms, measured in range rings and readiness rates, and felt most acutely by adversaries who discover the artillery line moved farther back while its precision moved farther forward.